Hey, South Hills. One of our values here is that we grow more in circles than we do in rows. In other words, coming to church and worshiping together on Sundays is important, but we believe your faith journey shouldn't just stop there. That's why we create multiple opportunities for you to grow beyond Sunday. And small groups is one of the best and easiest ways for you to get out of a row and into a circle. We were made to live lives of connection with God and with others. In fact, Ecclesiastics chapter four, verse nine says, it is better to have a partner than to go at it alone. Share the work, share the wealth. And if one falls down, the other helps. We are better, smarter, healthier, happier people when we do life with others. So don't miss the opportunity to start building authentic relationships with people sitting next to you on Sundays. Our next small group season kicks off in March, just a few weeks away. You can sign up for a group by visiting the Church Center app or stop by the Connect area after service. But whatever you do, please take advantage of this opportunity to build authentic relationships. So today's message is titled Shack Up. You've all heard that term up, term before, shack up, to shack up with someone. And it has a little tagline of I give it one year. All right, I give it one year. For those of you who have kids or have had kids uh, six or seven years old or even older, can you recall a time when they wanted you to buy something, right, something, and you said, Sorry, you can't afford it. And they, they quickly came back and said, oh, yes, you can. Just use your card. Just swipe. It works really good, Mom. Just swipe it, and they go, ding, and it's, we can take it home, right? In their mind, it, there's this magic wand that just gets them the stuff that they want. You see, children think that things, just, uh, things should just work without us having to work for them. As they get older, they learn how life actually works. A debit card only works when you deposit money in the bank. And to have money to deposit, you have to work. But you don't get to keep all the money (laughs) that you work for. Some gets taken out for taxes and insurance and people named FICA. (laughs) That was a rude awakening when... I opened my first check, and this person named FICA was taking some from it. And I immediately asked, who's this FICA dude? And why is he in my business? And also, you can't just buy things you want to buy because there are things that you have to buy. You could buy more things on credit, but then you have to pay that money back, which means that you're going to end up paying a lot more for it and what it actually costs. But as a kid, you, you kind of, uh, uh, you're kind of like, yeah, yeah, I, I know, I know, but I don't care. Can we just get the ice cream and go on the go-karts? That's what I want to do. And a lot of us have a hard time growing up, growing out of that. We have a hard time understanding that concept. And we have a hard time getting out of that, which is why we get stuck. Because we all really just want the ice cream. We all just really want the ice cream when we want the ice cream. I don't want to think long term. I don't, I don't, I don't. Why can't things just be the way I want them to be? Why can't I have pizza and ice cream? And go mini kart racing. But if you ignore the way things really work because you don't want to have to put in the work, friends, you're eventually going to have to face the consequences of the reality that you have ignored. 
Does that make sense? Think about it this way. Navigating an adult world with a childish mindset always ends up in disappointment. When you go around life actively pursuing and thinking and acting like a child, when you should be acting like an adult, things are going to be a little bit rough for you. And you're going to be somewhat, not somewhat, you're going to be very disappointed at things. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11 says, When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. There's a lot of categories that this verse speaks into, right? You can apply this verse on so many things in areas in your lives. But I want you to understand that this morning, I want you to be clear in understanding that this scripture, this piece of scripture is nestled inside a passage that's all about relationships. So we, we can take that scripture and we can apply it, right, to so many things. But when God purposed this to be written down and included he was actually talking about scripture. Uh, he was actually talking about uh, love and relationships. There's a certain feeling that we're chasing in life, right? And that's love, right? L-O-V-E. We're chasing love. Like love makes you feel a little bit nervous and sweaty. Your breathing becomes shallow. You're anxious and begin overthinking what you're going to wear, right? Uh, how to groom yourself better, right? There's a sense of excitement and anticipation that anything can happen because there's love. Because there's love. We say things like, oh, I've never felt like this before. This is incredible. I'm so in love. I'm so alive. I love feeling this, this love. It makes me want to skip around and, and dance in my house and, and listen to love songs all night long, right? We think of love as a feeling, as having chemistry. And truth be told, that's exactly what it is. But it's not the same chemistry you're talking about. It's brain chemistry. Contrary to pop songs and poetry, love is more a product of the head than of the heart. Oh, we're going to get in your kitchen this morning. Love is a product of the head. It's more of a product of the head than of the heart. You see, romantic love can be broken down into two main categories, attraction and attachment. Attraction and attachment. Today I'm speaking to all of the single people and soon-to-be single people, and eventually I'm going to get to the married people, all right? So be prepared. Don't start walking out on me now because I'm just getting into it, all right? The feeling of attraction is basically a dopamine buzz, all right? The feeling that you go around your house like floating on cloud nine and you look at the picture and you go, mm, they're so beautiful, they're so handsome, I love them. I wonder what they're doing right now. What are you doing right now? Right? What are you doing right now? That's more like it. Right? It's a byproduct of the dopamine buzz that's coming around. Dopamine gets us interested in each other. But it responds only to things that are new or that are possible, right, are possible rather than real. Once you're in a relationship, that dopamine excitement fades and eventually stops. So if you've been in a relationship for a little bit over a few years, and you've been married for quite more. My, my in-laws just celebrated 50 years yesterday. 50 years. And I was like, dang, that's a lot of time. Like, you kept it going on for 50 years. That's incredible. It's incredible, right? And it, 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 listen, the dopamine doesn't exist in that relationship anymore. <laughs> it just doesn't, right? Because it's not new. And we're going to learn about this, right? So hang on with me here. And so once you're in a relationship, that dopamine excitement fades and eventually stops. That's why passionate love fades, right? The thrilling mystery of the unknown becomes the boring familiarity of the everyday mundane kind of stuff. All of a sudden, they were beautiful. Now they're like, oh, I just woke up to them. 
your breath. Back up, right? For those of you who are in this season right now, who are in love, the recently fallen in love section of life, right? If you're going to stay attached, if you're going to continue your relationship, you're going to have to find a reason beyond the dopamine thrill of the new. But it's, it's cool, right? They look nice in that outfit. You're going out to the restaurant. Right? You're going out to the movies. You're going out. These dates are just great. You hold hands, right? It's just, it's, oh, it's nice. You get that, that little feeling inside. That dopamine is working. Eventually, that dopamine is going to fade, and you're going to have to figure things out, how to get past the new. Because constantly chasing something new isn't all that fulfilling. And as we said last week, finding a person is tough, but learning to live with that person is even tougher. And we've been warned about this right from the very beginning. In Genesis 3.16, it talks about the desire for your, uh, for your desire for, uh, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over, your, over you. And a lot of Christians look at that scripture and, and they want to hold it up this verse as a, relational, uh, as a relational goal. Ladies, your job is to want your man and men, your job is to keep your lady in line. <laughs> This passage is more descriptive than prescriptive. In other words, it's telling us the way things tend to be, not the way things ought to be. Because here's the thing, partners, people in relationship live in tension with one another. There, there's a constant tug of war here, struggling for power and control, but going after it in different ways. Men either power up, and completely take control of the relationship, or they power down and relinquish all control. Both create a fear of not being loved and wanted by her. Excuse me. She has this fear, creates a fear in her of not being loved and wanted, which is her greatest fear, not being loved and wanted. And then for women... You either manipulate through charm and flirting or you tear down uh, by questioning his ability to be a man, creating a feeling that he's not enough, which is his biggest fear of not amounting to being the man that he should be. The question often asked uh, uh, about this verse from Genesis is, who gets the final say? Who gets the final say? I mean, I know we're supposed to compromise and find common ground, but when we can't, when we can't find the common ground, when we can't compromise, who gets to assert their will over the others? Who has permission from the Bible to put their foot down and demand what they want? Well, friends, I don't think this verse in Genesis answers that. But there's one in Ephesians, that's Ephesians that might. And that's Ephesians 5.33 where it says, Husbands, love your wife and wives, respect your husbands. Right? Think about that. Husbands, love your wife. Wives, respect your husband. Meaning, like, there is a different role that each of you, the man and the woman, must take. And maybe you're thinking this morning, wait, that's not really an answer at all. That doesn't tell us who wins. And you're right. That's because the Bible isn't interested in pitting you against one another or giving you ammo against the other person. If that's the position, if that's your position, you're totally missing the point here. What he's saying is, men, do what is most loving to her. And woman, do what communicates the most respect to him. If each of you are looking out for the other, then the whole situation, the whole relationship will get better. Part of the, the disconnect church for us is that scripture isn't concerned with helping you get what you want as much as helping you give as much as you can. 
That's what Scripture is constantly trying to, to share with us and get us to understand. That this, this isn't about me, 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 me. That this relationship is about the other person. Which means it's answering a question that we're not asking most of the time. And that's why God commands it. Because we, we on our own don't want to do it. We on our own don't want to self-sacrifice for the benefit of the other person. Especially in circumstances where it's most needed. This idea is, is really all over the place, but it's best summarized here in Philippians chapter 2. It starts with verse, uh, with verse 2. It says, Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and one purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, asking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. Friends, if you leave here today with anything that you've grabbed on to, I want you to leave here with this. Love intentionally prioritizes them instead of impulsively preferring me. Real love prioritizes them, the other person, instead of being so fixated with me. But what does that mean to prioritize someone else? How does that happen? How do we do that? Well, let me break it down this morning. Number one, see more, see more than yourself. See more than yourself. See beyond your immediate needs and feelings. A lot of us get caught up in our own needs and our own feelings when it comes to relationships that we just do the other person wrong. In other words, this, this happens a lot in my household when it comes to my girls, and they've done it so much that I, they passed it on to me that I'm even doing it. And that's the part when you see a picture you're in, most of the people immediately look at themselves and ignore the rest of the people in the picture. Ew! Don't, don't, don't post that picture. Don't post that picture. I'm like, why? But it looks good. No, no, me, me, me. I don't like the way I look in that picture. Almost every picture we take, that's their reply. Ew! I don't like it. Mm, no, take another one. I'm like, but I look good in that picture. I look slim. They got the best side of me. Like, everyone looks good just because you went, that's not my fault. And so now they got me doing that. They take a picture. Oh, don't put, no. Oh, my belly. Mm -hmm. That's not good. That's not good. That, that wasn't a week I got a haircut. That, that's not good. That's not, that's not post that picture, right? And so we take these pictures and we ignore everyone else. The way we feel about the entire picture is based on the way we look. And we do it with pictures because we do it with everything else. Sometimes when we realize that we responded to something poorly, we say something like, hey, sorry, I was in my head a little bit too much. I was, it was all about me, sorry, right? And what we mean is I was thinking so much about what I was feeling and what I was wanting that I really wasn't thinking about anyone else or how they were thinking or how they were feeling. And I think that's super important for us to understand. We need to see more than yourself, than ourselves, Right? Love makes decisions based on what's good for us, not just what's good for me. So if you are in love, you are in love, this needs to be at the very forefront of your heart and of your mind, right? Love makes decisions based on what's good for us, not just what's good for me. Number two, do more than you want to. Do more. Act beyond your immediate needs and feelings. There's, the, there's the, the myth in our culture that says, just do what you love and, and you'll always love your life. Do what you love and you're always going to love your life. That's why I'm holding out for a full-time job doing X, Y, and Z instead of taking the jobs that's being offered to me. Meanwhile, you're bo bored, purposeless, and broke. Why? Why? Because what is right 
doesn't always feel right when it comes time to do it. No one wants to work every day. No one wants to work. You lie if you say you want to work every day. This is the house of God. Some of you are ready to raise your hand. Oh, I want to. No, you don't. No, you don't. No matter how much you love your job, you don't want to work every day. No one, want, no one who builds a great marriage feels head over heels every day for that other person. We stay the course because the, because the work is worth it. We put in the time and the effort and the energy because it is worth it. Jesus in Matthew 5 gives this relational advice and it says, turn the other cheek, go the extra mile, give them the shirt off your back. Each of these scenarios is about doing more than what we want to do. Getting past the thought of, I don't even want to go the first mile. And to be honest, much less the second mile. This isn't about you. It's about them. Number three, give more than you have. Give more than you have. There's more in you than you actually think. There's more in you, right? When you work out, right? For those of you who work out, when you work out with a trainer, they learn your limits and then incrementally push you past those limits because they understand that when you, uh, when you think that you got nothing left in the tank, there's always a little bit more. And giving it is how you grow, right? Noah's coach on basketball, when Noah's huffing and puffing, he says, you tired? And Noah goes, she goes, no, you're not. No, you're not. There's more in there. There's more in there. And immediately, it changes her attitude. And so when I tell them, go clean your room, it's, it's, you didn't, I did a good job. No, you didn't. No, I did a good job. They keep fighting me. And I'm telling them, no, but that doesn't work too much. Right? There's more in the tank. There's always a little bit more. And giving it is how you grow. Right? Getting past your limitations is how you grow. If you want to grow in an area, you have to sow in that area. You want to get better at something, you got to put the work in that something. If you want friends, then be friendly. If you want peace, then be a peacemaker. If you want to be blessed financially, then be generous. If you want to be loved, then love unconditionally. If you want respect, then earn it over a long haul. If you want more responsibility, then be faithful in the little things. If you want joy, then focus on the positives. If you want... um, to be listened to, then listen to others. If you want well, uh, health, then take care of your body. And if you want to eat your own french fries, don't get married. Mm-hmm. Some of you just don't want to say nothing because that person is next to you. But I know. Number four, love more. Love more than you feel. Love more than you feel. Put love into action, not needing emotion to drive your action. When we're single, we make the most of our own decisions in life. But when we partner with someone, we commit to giving them a significant say across the board. Right? When you're single, you make the choice of how you want your room to look in your, in your house, a house, how you want to decorate it. But the moment you get married, the moment you get married, you walk into that house and be like, oh, so I like the red curtain. I don't like the red curtain. I, I, that's not me. Okay, how we put the plant over here? Ah, I don't like that plant. I like it over here. In fact, I like cats. I don't like cats. I like dogs, right? This whole two worlds collide with one another. And so when you're single, we make the most of our own decisions. But when we partner up with someone, we commit to giving them a significant say across the board. Our home decor, what we do on Tuesday nights, right? How we dress, if we're going to spring for the latest smartphone. All of that now has to come to the table and it has to be discussed. Marriage means sharing, and sharing means giving up complete control. It means giving up what you want for the sake of someone, someone else. You can't just hog it up. You can't just, you know, I'm the captain, I'm the leader. 
Whatever I say goes, it doesn't work that way. Listen, love includes feelings but goes beyond them. It means continuing to act lovingly when you don't feel love, when you don't feel like it. We need to love. Jesus loved us to death, literally, his own. In other words, he sacrificed and sacrificed for us even when it hurt him. And he bore on his body the marks of his selfishness, selflessness, excuse me. Real love always leaves a mark, friends. Real love always leaves a mark. The things that you decided against, the things that you laid down, the opportunities that you set aside, the potential you chose not to fulfill, the dreams that you demoted, these are all proof. These are all proof of love. But I bet most of them didn't feel good at the time. It hurt. It cost you something. But that is what love is. With all that said, there are times that we need to draw lines and establish boundaries. That's the reality of it. Loving well isn't about martyrdom or, or enabling dysfunction in your relationship. If they're acting cocoa for cocoa puffs, you need to kind of draw a line and say, hey, this ain't, slow down. It's not what I signed up for. But it does involve difficult conversations and hard choices that we have to make. So design a lifestyle that allows you to heavily invest in others. It's not about losing yourself, but becoming your best self by deciding not to make everything about yourself. Does that make sense? It's understanding that, man, you're in this relationship with someone that you love and care about. And you can't be selfish, that there are things that you need to consider about the other person in that relationship and figure out how to make it best work out. The longer a relationship goes, the easier it is to to make it more about you, right? The more you're in the relationship, the easier it is to make it about you, what you want, what you deserve, what you're not doing that they should be doing. And what happens in this thing that started off with you being enamored and in love with them and being willing to do anything for them evolves into something that's about what they are not doing for you. And some of us, some of us end up turning into someone we never wanted to be. We turn up into someone we never really wanted to be. A person who's always insisting on what they want and hounding them about what they need to improve. You end up demanding more from them than you're willing to invest in them. But when you withdraw more than you deposit, you end up going relationally broke or bankrupt when you're constantly taking out of your relationship more than what you're giving into it, it's going to cause issues in your relationship. The principle we laugh at kids for not understanding about finances is the same principle many of us haven't learned about relationships as adults. If you swipe your card and you haven't put anything into the account, you're going to walk away very disappointed. Relational expert Dr. John Gottman talks about an idea he calls an emotional bank account. Most accounts, excuse me, most acts that fill the account of your partner are small acts, everyday gestures of appreciation and understanding, affection, and kindness. Anytime that you do these things, you're making a direct deposit into their account. Research has found it's the number one thing, it's the number one determining factor in whether or not a couple, a couple's relationship is happy based on how much gets deposited. The magic ratio is five to one. Five to one. Five deposits for every one withdrawal. 
I can see your mind thinking, when was the last time I was drunk? Am I meeting that need five to one? Also, relationships where one person makes all the deposits and the other only makes withdraw, withdraws doesn't work at all. The point of this message today is not to put more pressure on someone uh, who's over-depositing. You can't keep asking them to keep depositing so that you can keep withdrawing. If you always go where they want to go, do what they want to do, eat at their favorite place, pick up the slack every time something doesn't get done, listen to their stories and feelings, but never get to share your own, that imbalance is going to bankrupt you and you are going to turn bitter. If you happen to have a partner that tends to do too much, you're going to have to try extra to get them to slow down and share with you so that you can serve them. And you're going, it's, it's, it's a must. This is not suggestive preaching. This is a must in order to keep the relationship going and healthy and happy. I'm going to wrap this up this morning here. I hope that you've been able to kind of take a lot of what we've been sharing, or I've been sharing here from the platform, uh, and apply it to your life, to your relationships. Uh, in no shape or way or form, and I'm uh, a relationship expert. <laughs> I'm still learning and I'm still growing and I'm still applying it. I've been married to my wife for a little over 27 years. I'm still trying to figure things out. I've said this before. <laughs> We're like oil and water. She thinks one way and I think another way. And we got to work, work hard on how to continue to deposit and have a healthy relationship. I probably say this, honestly say that this is probably the best season that our relationship has been in. We do more laughing and joking than ever before. But we've also made it our purpose and our business to deposit more. To deposit more. And so how do we take what we've learned here today and begin to apply to our current relationships, whether you're single, whether you just started dating, or you've been married for many years? I believe it starts by asking yourself, looking in the mirror and asking yourself, man, how can I show them I'm willing to lay down what I want for the sake of what they want more often? doesn't have to be every time. But how do I do that? How willing of a participant am I to be? So let me give you some practical ways to increase your partner's emotional bank account. Pay attention to them. Something so simple. Pay attention to them. Take notice of how they act and respond to what they may need. One of the things in my relationship, my wife would come to be like, hey, this is what's going on. And I immediately took that. She wants my two cents. I'm going to give her five, but she wants my two cents. When in essence, she didn't want any of it. She just wanted me to listen. Pay attention to her. Right? So pay attention to them. Number two, invite them to share. Stand in the kitchen and ask them how their day uh, went when they get home. Give them 20 to 30 minutes of undivided attention to listen to everything that's happening on their side, right, of their life, outside of your relationship. Ask questions. Try and understand. Mirror their emotions. Make an apology if needed, Right? can't tell you how many times my wife is sharing and she's she's sharing her emotions and I'm like why is she crying I'm gonna cry for that stuff I've learned over the years that Jesus said break you know we 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 (laughs) break our hearts for what breaks theirs and so we got to be participants in this 
You see, relationships collapse when outside stress spills into the relationship and it's felt generally but never talked about specifically. So when you brush over things, when you sweep things under the rug, you're not helping it out at all. Get in there. Address it. Feel for what they feel. See their side of things. Another thing you can do is show gratitude daily. Show gratitude daily. Pick one specific thing each day to affirm them about. About their hair, about their outfit, about how nice or what they said. Don't talk so much about the bad breath. Love on them. I was young. My mom would kiss me. She had just drank coffee, and she would kiss me. And I was like, ooh, mom, don't back up. That doesn't smell good. And that has tarnished coffee forever in my life. But my my wife loves coffee. And I've had to, (laughs) despite my personal feelings about coffee. I'm helping you here, guys. I'm helping you here. Lastly, be touchy-feely. And I know you're like, oh, I don't want to. Don't want to be touchy-feely. But let's listen, listen, listen. Linda, listen here. Statistics show that couples that kiss and hug and hold hands and cuddle and gently touch each other in passing report having significantly better sex lives. So every time you go around and hug her and kiss her and hold him and, and grab his hand and all of these things would eventually lead to a better sex life. I'm helping you out. Here's the thing. I get that one and all of these things might be uncomfortable. But that's not the point here. If you want to have a long lasting relationship. You're going to have to elevate caring for them over just being comfortable. It's not just about you being comfortable because all relationships require work. Love requires work. Love is costly, friends. And maybe you're thinking, man, where do I start? Which is one of the most, which one is more important than the other? One way could simply be to ask, how can I make your life easier today? How can I make your life easier today? How can I love you more? My wife and I went on a date the other day. And right there, smack the middle of the restaurant, she pulls out a list. I was like, I'm in trouble. She goes, I just want to ask you some things. And I was like, oh, Lord. She wanted to go down and see, ask these questions about me and to see if she knew the right answer. And so here we are in the middle of the restaurant. I got a piece of bread in my mouth as I'm trying to answer her questions. And I'm like, hey, that's pretty cool. You got the answer. You know the answer to that. And then we flipped it around. And, and we and before we left, we there was a lot that we got right. There was a bit that we forgot. And there's another section that said, wow, I didn't know that. 27 years in the making, and there are still things that I'm learning new. That left me with so much appreciation for her and, and the fact that I still got work to do to keep this love going and moving in the right direction. And I hope you leave here with that same understanding. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we bless you and we thank you, Lord, for your goodness, your mercy, and your grace. We thank you, Lord, that you are teaching us about relationships. You're teaching the young students to the oldest in this room that have been married for many, many years. And I hope, Lord, that we would take heed and and take your word and say, man, not only do I need to get better by loving my significant other, but I want to get better. 
I want to give more than I am taking or being given. So Lord, thank you for that. Thank you for helping us understand and strengthen and positioning us to strengthen our relationships. To you be all the glory and all the honor. In your name we pray, amen, amen. Let's worship a little bit more before we leave here today.